Good morning, Susan. Hi, Brian. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. It's safe to kick things off. Perfect. So um, welcome everybody to Mapping Spatial Health Data. This is a, a workshop for the Our Medicine Conference. Um, myself and um, Susan Pakin will be uh, speaking to you about, about these um, about this about this stuff. So we're both at the Healthy Regions and Policies Lab that's housed at the Center for Spatial Data Science. So um, a little bit about the lab in general, and then we'll kind of go into more intros of each of us. So the Healthy Regions and Policies Lab is based at the Center for Spatial Data Science. Um, we integrate GI science, public health, and statistical approaches to explore, understand, and promote healthy communities. Uh, we believe in spatial data science for good and also, therefore, maintain a commitment to open science and open source methods and applications. So we're a bit unique in using um, coding like R um, to do a lot of the actual GI science and statistical work that our, our shop does. Um, so I'm Renia Kolek. I'm a health geographer slash spatial FE slash spatial data scientist. Um, I actually come from the physical sciences. I was trained as a geologist, and then I shifted over to people, um, continuing my love for databases, um, but kind of extending that to stats, public health. I'm really interested in how where you live impacts, interacts with, drives, magnifies health outcomes. Susan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a researcher with the lab and also a project manager. Um, and um, my background is in social science research um, and spatial data science, particularly with a lens on public policy um, and policy analysis. Um, I also, my, uh, my background um, is also in uh, sustainable agriculture and farming. And so I've worked a lot in food systems, particularly looking at food access and issues around um, equity and access in uh, food and nutrition spaces. Um, so really glad to be um, bringing, sort of integrating some of that work with um, broader public health topics. Definitely. And um... So in a minute, I'll also um, give the chances for the TAs to briefly introduce themselves if they're if they're interested. Um, today's workshop, we're going to be doing a couple things. This is a crash course in intro to using R as a GIS and um, as well as kind of learning about spatial analysis and mapping. So we're going to understand the basics of those things in R. Um, a big part of that will be standardizing data at the neighborhood level, which is one of the biggest um, tools that um, our group uses are for as well as many other groups um, and also integrating data from another source if you have spatial and non spatial data how do you connect those things we will also calculate some new variables and then of course um, because that's usually the reason folks want to join these workshops in the first place we will also make lots of maps um, you'll learn that our groups focus in just with within geographic information science, maps may be the actual last stage of, of uh, or it's at the very first stage or the very last stage. Um, so the maps are not end products for us. Um, they're kind of part of the journey <laughs> in um, understanding um, more complex phenomena that are occurring at the neighborhood level. Um, so we'll be taking about five minute breaks between each section. We'll have an intro to our spatial section, mapping neighborhoods, adding health resources, calculating spatial metrics, and then a final Q&A resource sharing session. That last session is there also as Slack in case we um, get a little over on any one of these sections. So it's helpful to build that in. Um, if you'd like to follow along with the live coding, um, I created a workbook um, as an art book down that includes all the materials here. So feel free to, um, or um, we can repaste the, all the different um, links that will be useful for you, okay? Um, but at this stage, um, would the TAs want to quickly introduce themselves and also just so that you're familiar with who they are. So if you have questions as we're going through, um, our medicine conference has this great feature where TAs are available to help. So feel free to unmute and, and introduce. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shell Smith. I hope I'm audible. 
Okay, my name is Shell Smith Karaoke, uh, but most people in the community know me as Shell. I am based in Nairobi, Kenya. I am a data analytics consultant who is always very interested in working with spatial data, and I am happy to be here. Thank you. I'm Mara Alexeyev. Um, I'm a general pediatrician, um, and I help organize our medicine. I don't know anything about spatial data, but I do know about R, and so happy to troubleshoot for stuff like that. Um, I also help set up the R Studio Cloud workspace with you. Um, so you can put messages in the chat and I'll, I'll be able to help troubleshoot you for that if you need it. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Kamenetsky. I'm a PhD candidate in epidemiology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I work on statistical methods for spatial cluster detection. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Will. I'm a statistician and R package developer in the life sciences. I am a complete novice at spatial data, um, but I would, I, I'll, I'll be learning along with everyone and I'll be helping out with um, R related technical issues and anything else that I can be uh, useful with. Super, I think that's it. Um, we had one more RTA, but he wasn't able to make it today, but he's here in spirit. <laughs> awesome. All right, so um, again, TAs are here to help. Message one of these awesome um, TAs if you get stuck or have a question. I think Niels was the TA who was not able to be here today, but again, where he's he's here in spirit. And again, um, this course is, or this kind of short workshop, um, CME credits are available. And at this stage, I'll switch over to um, Susan to kind of explain the process for this and then take us through some of the intro um, concepts for our first chapter. Sure. So um, I just dropped the link in the chat for if you are interested in and would like to claim CME credits for participation um, in this session. Um, this session is eligible for, oh, it looks like the slide didn't update, but I just updated it. It's a maximum of three uh, where it says 1.5, it's just say three AMA category one credits. So that's, it's by um, hour. So for three hour session, um, you can um, earn up to three CME credits. The link in the chat is just links to a PDF with instructions of how to do that through the University of Chicago CME um, continuing learning office. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me or the um, Tom at the CME office. Um, his email is posted there and it's also in that PDF. I think that's it for that. So with that, um, we're gonna transition to the introductory part of our workshop today. Um, the way that the rest of the, um, I was gonna say morning, but it's <laughs> afternoon, evening, and lots of different parts of the world. But the rest of the session will go is that um, I'll uh, sort of introduce some of the concepts that we'll be um, uh, working through in our analysis and our, our live coding. Um, and then Marinia will take it from there in walking through exercises um, and actually applying um, a lot of these concepts. So again, this is a crash course. We do have three hours, but we've we've stuffed a lot of information into these three hours. So hopefully, um, you know, this first part with the slides is helpful in framing some of the big picture concepts, and then you'll actually get be able to get your hands dirty um, in doing some of the live coding in the R Studio Cloud um, setup. So with that, um, first, we're all in this mapping um, spatial health data workshop, but at its foundation, what is spatial data? Um, so spatial data refers to data that contains um, information about specific locations. So in other words, both information and location are two key elements in spatial data. Um, on some occasions, spatial data might only contain the information about the location of where something is, but oftentimes um, we're talking about data that has the location, but then other information as well. So this could be something as simple as the location of a hospital and then the hospital name, the hospital like address and any other information about the hospital. Um, so, uh, yeah, so key here is that spatial data must contain location data and also enable that 
um, in, in, the, in the R ecosystem, which we'll see um, how to do that shortly. Next slide, please. So when we talk about spatial data, we're generally talking about two types of spatial data. There's vector data and raster data. Um, we're, gonna be we're gonna be primarily working with vector data in the workshop today, um, but no, so I'm not gonna spend time discussing raster data. Um, raster data is often, you see it as satellite data, but know that R, you can definitely work with spatial data, with raster spatial data in R specifically. Um, and um, yeah, there are lots of resources um, talking about how to work with raster data in R as well. But back to vector data, vector data um, represents the world surface using three main, um, three main uh, uh, models. So points, lines, poly and polygons or areas um, as it's described here. Um, so for example, um, a group of individual hospitals or clinics might be represented as point locations on a map, um, whereas the zip code areas in which the hospitals are located, um, the boundaries of which would be represented as areas. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. So there are a number of data formats that we can work with when we're talking about working with spatial data and specifically spatial data in R. Um, today, we're gonna to be looking at a few non-spatial and spatial data formats. So with CSVs, um, know that a CSV on its own is not a spatial data format, but it can store spatial data if it has columns um, with latitude and longitude that represent coordinate locations. Um, so those columns on their own are not spatial, but when they're enabled in the R spatial ecosystem, then they represent actual points in space. Again, we'll see that uh, in action in, in momentarily. Um, next slide. But two other sort of key spatial data formats that we'll also work with today um, are shapefiles and GeoJSONs. So shapefiles are a data format that was actually first developed by Esri. They are made up of at least four extension files. Um, so you see them listed here. The .shp is the file that you'll generally be working with. Um, and then GeoJSONs are, excuse me, are um, also a standard format for encoding a variety of geographic and spatial data structures. So that's another common format that um, you'll see a lot in working with spatial data as well. And it's, it's very easy to use generally. And just know that other spatial data formats include KML and GeoPackage, and there's actually, there's a whole long list of other, other formats. So in R, um, one of the most commonly used spatial uh, libraries is SF. The SF library uses um, a few sort of key data structures. Um, there's the data table, which is um, you know, a table or a two-dimensional array um, uh, structure. The tibble, which is the tidyverse versioning or reimagining of the data frame. And, um, and then again, the, an, SF, um, a, a, an, an SF structure uh, refers to simple features, which is a formal standard actually that describes how objects in the real world can be represented um, with an emphasis on the spatial geometry of those objects. So again, simple features is terminology that exists outside of the R spatial e um, ecoverse, but it, uh, but we also refer to the SF library and the SF data structure um, within this world. Next slide, please. So another uh, key concept that we wanted to introduce before di diving into some of the coding um, is the uh, really foundational concept of coordinate reference systems or CRS. So this is sort of one of the key, uh, really important elements that you need to know really upfront when you're starting to work with spatial data, because it can really trip, trip you up, um, especially when you get to generating maps or any sort of uh, calculations uh, between points in space. So um, a coordinate reference system 
um, or a CRS communicates what method should be used to flatten or project the Earth's surface onto a two-dimensional map, which is, of course, what we're looking at when we're creating maps on our, uh, on our devices. So different CRSs can apply different ways of projecting and different uh, di ways of projecting information and can generate substantially different visualizations. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see, oh, it looks like, oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, we'll see a few different uh, examples of different projections of ways of looking at the world. Um, and these different projections basically can, can really alter the way that we foundationally understand, um, you know, in, in this context, we're looking at the world. So we're looking at like how, how big um, different continents and countries appear to be, um, and how does that measure in real uh, or change in different projections? Um, and how does that change both our numerical and quantitative um, uh, estimates as well as our perceptions? Um, if anyone's seen that West Wing episode about mapping projections, um, <laughs> where CJ's mind is blown about the different mapping projections, uh, I think that that really drives home uh, what a difference that that this concept um, can make in, in how we visualize spatial data. So we'll be working with some different CRSs today during the, um, during, during the coding, but we wanted to highlight this here. Thanks. So CRSs can be referred to using a, what's called an SRID, which stands for Spatial Reference System Identifier. Um, so there's different types of SRIDs, but one of the most commonly used systems that, are, that uh, we use are EPSG codes. So the EPSG, co EPSG database is one of the most comprehensive databases that store thousands of different projections that are used across industries um, and in different con uh, contexts, particularly in the GIS, geographic information science context. Um, EPSG 4326, is one of the most commonly used projections today. Um, we'll see that one, um, again, we'll, we'll use that one as sort of the foundational projection um, in, in, our, in our code. Um, and you'll often, oftentimes your data will start at 4326, but then you'll transform it to a different CRS that might be more adapted to your local area that you're studying or mapping or the, or the region. Um, so we'll, we'll dive into that more in a minute. In a minute. Um, and also in R, in the SF package, you can use the function stcrs to check the CRS used in the data or sttransform to reproject the data to a different CRS um, from if you're missing a CRS to add a CRS or if you're changing from 4326 to a different EPSG code, for example. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to Marinia. Um, hopefully that provided some good context as we dive more into how to apply these concepts in R. Excellent, so just bear with me while I, I shift a few things around here and get, getting ready for this. I'm going to share my whole screen and we'll kind of see how this works. <laughs> All right, so. Okay, I've got to move the zoom thing. Okay, so first things first. Um, so again, the code, uh, the code for what we'll be going through will be available here. So that's, I believe, has been added to the chat a couple different times, and that will be important because it turns out that um, some of these spatial packages, like slightly different versions, will have slightly different outcomes. So I'm showing it to you here as the goal, <laughs> and then. Um, so if one part doesn't work, just kind of bookmark that and come back to it later. Okay, so I just wanted to say that kind of starting out, um, one of the issues we're gonna hit right away will be related to CRS, CRSs and how, um, so there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different coordinate reference systems out there, right? There are entire fields of geophysics that are kind of dedicated to this sort of work. Um, so it turns out that with the RStudio cloud version, um let's see this is the link that um was shared so the r markdown files and data folder that was 
um, current as of this morning um, have, has been loaded here, as well as a couple of different um, core packages that you need. But long story short, we'll find that there may be some pieces that won't render completely the same way. And I think that's interesting though. And, and we can, you know, we can talk about that when, when that comes up. Um, uh, but first, let me go to the background section here. Um, so there's three core libraries that we're going to be working with today, SF, TMAP, and Tidy G Coder. Everything that we're doing can, those, those three um, packages are going to deliver the, the core goals. However, I understand that everyone, and I, I understand and respect that everyone has a different R kind of system or ecosystem that works for them. So if you're a Tidyverse and Tidy user, um, I leave a couple breadcrumbs throughout of like, this is where, you know, this can be further optimized with, with the Tidyverse. See, you know, see what you can do from there. Um, and, um, and so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind. With that being said, um, in this project environment, um, again, the four our, our markdown files as of 9 a.m. this morning are included there, as well as the data folder for the data that you need. And again, to work with this, you can either, I believe, like start typing right away or save as a permanent copy and kind of go from there. I'm gonna work from my RStudio and my system, partly because, um, if, if you're if you're a Zoom host, it, it's already a lot of bandwidth, and I don't want to explode <laughs> this whole thing um, by any means. Um, but again, the it's it's going to be the same code, and we're working with the same workbook. Okay, but let's start off to the intro to spatial data part. Again, so far what Susan went through was like what is spatial data, what is the SF framework within um, that sort of thing. So. Um, will and I should note here in the workbook normally in my own kind of day-to-day -day practice I'll load all the libraries I need at the very top however with this workshop I'm actually loading libraries when we start to need them just so that you know which library you're working with at any given time I find that's really helpful for troubleshooting spatial workflows um, so that's why I'm doing it that way <laughs> all right um, I will also note, um, let's go to a lot of the data that we're working with is real data um, from, and in this case, the city of Chicago data portal. So a lot of times uh, the, 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 the biggest challenge to working with this stuff is knowing um, where do I get the data, right? So we're gonna be working with COVID data. That data was downloaded directly from, you know, in raw format from the Chicago data portal. Um, for example, if we want zip code um, boundaries, um, that is also available, and so on and so forth. Um, large cities will have data portals, whereas smaller cities will not. Um, so we also will give you a few hints of where to get data um, throughout the rest of um, the workshop. There will be, um, we have another toolkit that gives you a nice census data wrangling um, option. And then we'll also introduce some other, uh, how do I call this, uh, massive like data repositories that have a lot of different clean data that's kind of customized to uh, public health, um, clinical health audience. Okay. All right. That being said, um, we're going to first load in um, here. I'm going to switch over to my RStudio environment. And um, in this environment, um, let's clean things up a little bit. I'm going to pretend that we're kind of starting from scratch <laughs> and we're going. So um, first things first, you know, we want to um, load the library SF, which um, I've already done, but just so that you, you believe that, um, we're going to use the st read function um, in SF to actually read the shapefile. So here it's really important that whenever you work with a shapefile that all of the extensions are in the folder where you're reading from. Um, I've seen some students, uh, and when I say student, it could be a surgeon who's just learning spatial analysis or it could be an undergrad, right? <laughs> There's a big, a big, big range there. Um, so sometimes you think that you just want to work with the .shp file, but the .dbf extension is where all the attribute data is held, and the .prj um, extension is where the actual 
coordinate reference system is held. So it turns out to be pretty important to include all of that. Okay, so I'm going to read that. And when it is read, um, SF gives me a nice kind of overview of what was just included. So we're using an Esri shape file. Um, it's a polygon, and that's important to kind of confirm that it is what we expect. You know, we were learning loading zip codes. So if they were points, that would be kind of odd. Um, so fortunately, they are areas, which is what we expected. Okay. Um, as soon as we load something in, and I and I should note here too, this is an Esri shape file. Um, how many of you have heard of ArcGIS or Esri? You can use the raising hand function. Okay. Well, that's like the predominant long time proprietary way to do GI to do GIS for a really, really long time. Um, and it turns out they have a proprietary data format as well, which is Esri shapefile. They're kind of like, I mean, Microsoft is different now. They were kind of like the Microsoft of the 90s, you know, at, you know, similar to that to <laughs> GIS systems today, like super massive or another um, analogy might be Oracle. Like they're the Oracle of, of GIS, massive. Um, contracts throughout the country, really, really, I mean, the, I, I worked with ArcGIS um, for a decade before I started to switch into open source systems, but they're still really um, uh, visible and predominant in the GIS workspace. And so this is one of the ways that we'll start to see, see them, right, um, through this kind of spatial format. If you work with GIS analysts in your, in your place of work or through collaborators, they might want to have the data as a shape file. So that's another way that you might see it in this way. Okay, but as soon as you have that, um, so one of the ways, as soon as you load something in, especially especially in um, when working with spatial analysis, is to look at it. You wanna look at it as soon as possible just to make sure that it is what you think it is. Um, so we see that we have zip code information, there's also some community areas, census tracts, that sort of thing. It's not a super clean data set, which is pretty common for uh, data portals. Um, but we also have this geometry column here, polygon and a bunch of information. That's actually the SF data frame that is working in action, okay? Um, all right, so, so that is, so just to look at your data, if you use tidyverse, you might use the function glimpse. I like to use a function head just to look at the top six. Um, but we also want to look at the, um, the spatial data. So we can use a base R function plot just to look at this. And um, I might have to move this up again. The base R uh, function, the way that it's connected, it, it gets rerouted essentially with SF so that the plots are going to be plots. Every single attribute will be plotted. Okay. Um, I, I think we had a question. Feel free to ask. Oh, Irene. Okay. Or right, Irene can I might have been left, over left over. From before. All good, yeah. all good. Okay. And yeah, feel free to just ask questions in the chat too. Um, so this is kind of a really nice feature of SF. The older framework, SP, doesn't do this. So I, I mean, I just wanted to note that. So here, SF is repurposing that plot function from BASAR um, to give us a look. And we can see that, you know, the only, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of different data here. Not super useful to us, but we're going to kind of work with it. Um, let's look at um, here. Actually, I'll come on this side because some of these aren't necessarily worth live coding immediately. Um, so let's look at the structure of the Chicago tracks. I can see that it's both a data frame as well as an SF object. OK, so just keep that in mind because that kind of information might be useful when you're troubleshooting. Um, and the geometric object, the geometry type is SFC polygon. So if we want to look at the coordinate reference system of uh, the tracks, um, we can it's just by using this function st underscore CRS. And this can be really useful. Um, it tells us that the coordinate reference is 4326. That's, again, the most common one that Susan already mentioned. And it gives you a little bit of information. Um, the most important thing here is this unit call right here. What is the unit? The, how do we measure distance in this coordinate reference system? Well, we measure it in degrees. 
So degrees, we, when we talk about like how far away is, you know, the nearest hospital, we don't say it's 10 degrees away because the earth is curved and speaking in degrees at low, at small scales is, doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Maybe if you're flying somewhere um, and you're a super, super nerd, you might talk about distance in degrees, but that's not really common anywhere else. So that's the really uh, a pretty important part of uh, knowing what coordinate reference system is this is in, because if we want to do any type of analysis to this later, where distance needs to be in feet or meters, we're going to have to change it, right? So um, at this stage, we are shifting to the exploration of coordinate reference systems. And here, um, some of you may see an error uh, when you are when you are coding. Well, I'll, in, in the R cloud instance, I'll explain that in just a second. Okay, so first we're gonna try, um, and, and these are not coordinate reference systems you would know off the top of your head. This is just me showing you a couple different options just to see how using a different coordinate reference system can really change your place. So first we'll try the mole wide coordinate reference system, and that does a pretty good job preserving area across the globe. And that might be important because, you know, if you are looking at a global phenomenon um, that is beyond a very small area, preserving area could be could be pretty important. So we use the ST transform function. Um, you essentially just pass the spatial object and then you type in the coordinate reference system that you want to um, project to. So in my version, and again, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. I, I can't figure out why. So in my version, when I run this, I get uh, a plot that looks like this. We see this kind of sideways looking um, city of Chicago. So this is not the city of Chicago that we're familiar with. However, this is more true to the actual um, view of the city of Chicago on the actual planet, right? So there's this kind of disjoint between how we think of things and how things actually are, right? So this, um, the areas are preserved, so on and so forth. However, if you're running this on RStudio Cloud, you might be getting an error. What does the error say? I don't know if anyone's gotten it. Or maybe no one's live coding, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, when I was trying this on the RStudio Cloud instance, I got an error saying that CRS is not found. And I thought, what? That's That, that shouldn't be, right? So the um, like I mentioned before, there are thousands of different coordinate reference systems and different utilities that store all that information somewhere on your system. Um, for some reason, I'm not sure why, it seems like the, um, at least for some, again, if, if I'm the only person who experienced it on the cloud, then, then, then that's not that bad. Um, maybe that's even more odd. Um, but if you're getting an error here, it might just mean that that specific coordinate reference system or that library of coordinate reference systems may not be available um, in your like in, in the RStudio cloud setup, right? Troubleshooting that is going to take more time than we have today. Um, but just kind of keep that in mind. If you go through the standard way of loading things in um, on your own system, this shouldn't this this probably won't come up. OK, it might just be a storage issue or something like that. I'm not quite sure. Um, okay, so we've got that. Um, so we have this lovely uh, map. Next, let's try the Winkle coordinate reference system. This is another compromise, or this is another projection that um, is trying to minimize distortion for area, but it's also trying to minimize distortion for distance and angles. Those are the three things that you always have to think about, areas, distance, angles. So we're gonna use the same approach, recycling the code, but with new inputs. So here, instead of having CRS equals, another way of inputting it is just typing in the actual EPSG number. I find that to be a little bit easier sometimes. So again, for my version, this is going to uh, put correctly. For your version, maybe not. And if it doesn't, it's because the CRS library isn't, um, isn't present. But fortunately, you're probably not going to use these very often, so I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> so here we can see that the, the map is a little bit less smushed. You know, it's minimizing distortion, but um, in that minimizing of distortion, um, it might mean that the, the areas are not as preserved as well as the one that we saw before. Um, we can also try a completely different type of projection. So I, I searched, so a lot of when you're searching for EPSG projections, it's a Google search. So I literally searched Hawaii EPSG 
and a bunch of different um, projection options showed up from the EPSG website. Like the, that's the first thing that popped up in the search. So I chose Old Hawaiian UTM Zone 4N and let's see what that looks like. It's clearly the wrong projection, right? We know that the um, Chicago is not bent like this. So again, I just really wanted to emphasize that your coordinate reference system can impact your um, findings. And furthermore, um, at least half of the errors I've seen for beginners or, you know, and intermediate and sometimes advanced users of our spatial, a lot of times the issue is in the coordinate reference system itself. Um, so I just had a, a, a student, a grad student who was doing a really complex point pattern analysis and like probability um, surface um, work with spatial analysis and he was struggling with an error for over a week. It was a coordinate reference system issue. Okay, so now let's go to something that we feel a little bit better about. Um, uh, EPSG, an EPSG that is going to preserve distance as something that we're familiar with and that is really focused on our area. So because we're looking at Chicago, I literally Googled um, Illinois feet EPSG, right? And one of the first things that popped up is EPSG 3435. I know that doesn't sound very scientific, but it turns out that that is like EPSG 3435 is the standard projection used for um, kind of mapping and sort of survey use in the Chicago area. And you have to think about the Google search algorithm. Who are other people that might have typed in the same code, you know, the same words? Well, other people who know what EPSGs are, which are likely a pretty small kind of GIS, again, GIS nerd group. So, so, this, so Google searching is really your friend when it comes to our spatial stuff. Okay, so this is more with how we're familiar with it. Here, distance is in feet, which we can easily convert to miles for US-based work. Um, and, um, you know, it's not maybe preserving angles, you know, uh, areas, that sort of thing as much as the previous maps. But for our audience, this is going to make a lot more sense. Okay, so now we're going to switch from, um, and I, sh I should also note, I've been extending the use of base R plot in, in these um, maps. I usually don't use base R ever for plotting, but I just wanted to show you that you can, if you want, um, you're going to be plotting just the geometry value of the objects. Um, you can adjust the border, the thickness of the borders, um, give it a title, subtitle, so on and so forth. But what I really like to work with, um, especially for rapid kind of exploratory spatial data analysis, is a package called TMAP. So um, with TMAP, there's a lot of customization available. We're going to approach mapping with one layer at a time. Um, essentially, so first we're going to load in TMAP. And actually having it rendered on this side might be a little bit um, easier than sometimes the plots can get a little bit buggy. Um, over here. Okay, um, but so we have loaded TMAP, and when we're working with TMAP, it, it's going to always require two function calls per layer. So first you have to call the shape that you want to map. So in this case, try tracks, that's what we want to map. But we could also call, or, but then we have to add some styling parameter. It has to have something, even if you um, take out the parameter specification and just have TM borders, you know, with the parenthesis, that's fine. Um, but here we're going to make the borders a little bit transparent, and this is your standard TMAP, okay? But what's really nice with TMAP is that you can start to add a lot of other, um, again, you can really customize it a lot. So you can um, add a specific color for the borders, but then you can um, color the fill, um, so the inside of the polygon is a different color. We can add a scale bar, we can see that down here. Um, and then if we didn't like that frame that's around it, we can just add a, a function a TM layout frame equals false. I should note here, I did not have any of this memorized. And when you're working with TMAP and things like this, it's going to be pretty rare that you remember exactly how to put the parameter, you know, input in the right place in the right space. So it's, it's highly recommended that you find um, suites of, you know, uh, existing TMAP tutorials, the documentation, all that stuff, just to look at different options. So this is actually really similar to geology work, where the more outcrops you see, the better geologists you get. 
So here, the more coding snippets you see, the better you get at coding because you just see more different types of options available to you. OK, so um, I really like this specific um, link that gives you a lot of the it's kind of like the full on recipe book of all the different function parameters. So you'll see some nuances like instead of TM fill, um, TM polygons seems like it does a similar thing, but there, you know, there's some there's some nuances between that. But this is part of the journey. It's meant to be fun to explore those different options. Um, and then another thing you can do is um, arrange multiple maps. So sometimes we want to look at multiple maps at once. This is what we call a map panel. Um, there are, it turns out, many different ways of doing this. Um, this is, again, the wonderful world of TMAP. You can look do TM facet maps, a lot of different options. We're going to use uh, one version where we just take the map uh, calls and assign them to variables. And then we're going to call those variables in TMAP arrange. So here, I'm going to take my TMAP um, of from 4326, uh, which is like the standard, you know, EPSG projection. It's also the projection that Google Maps uses um, and, and that sort of thing. So we're going to take that map. But then we're also going to look at a map um, that was very different. And let's see, and I, I think 54019 was the Winkle map. So we're going to write this to tracks 4326, and we'll write this one to 54019, and then we're going to arrange them as such. Okay. All right. So here we're, you know, creating a different mood. Um, we have this light gray background. And so here, and then just the name of the EPSG on each of these, um, I'm intentionally creating a different mood here because here the focus is not on the tracks themselves. I'm actually using a hack to erase the boundaries and just show the fill. So it looks like I'm just looking at Chicago. It's almost like I just have the Chicago boundary filled in, right? Um, so I just wanted to gently show those two different types of projections side by side, just to show the, the difference. Um, but again, so TMAP arrange is pretty, pretty nice. So at this point, I'm going to switch back to this side. I'm going to move this up a little bit. And um, what we've been working with so far is the mode of TMAP that is static, right? All the maps that we've been seeing are, are just our plain maps. Another option is having interactive maps. And for this, we need to switch to a different mode, view. There's only two modes. It's either plot mode or view mode. So this is this is an easy thing that you can memorize after a little bit of time. Um, so here we're going to take the exact same map as we as we just did, um, or at least the one that we did a couple steps up, and um, we're going to to view that. So let's let's see what happens here. Okay, you get a couple warning messages, which is totally fine. And actually, the nice part about working on this within our studio is that you can actually click the zoom right there in your window, and you can actually really see the whole the whole thing. Okay, so um, it's taking a second for the tiles to render, probably because I'm just on um, you know hosting a Zoom call, and it does that. But as we zoom in here, we can see that this city of Chicago is being appropriately placed on the Great Lakes, OK? And I really like using the interactive mode not just to make cool maps, but also just to double check that things are plotting where they're supposed to be plotting. So the nice thing here is we also have an option to try a different base map. Um, so those are all options to us. One thing that's maybe not great with this version is that there's, there's, they're not, the tracks are not very transparent so that we can't see the, the base map very well. Um, but that's something that we can change for sure. Another thing that's nice is you can click on each of these tracks and it gives you all the information that you need. You can imagine that you can, you know, clean up the data set a little bit better. And essentially, you're creating your own web map, right? Um, as you zoom in and zoom out, the scale bar will also change. And you can export this as either an image, but you can also save it as a web page. So I've made web maps, I mean, super rudimentary web maps this way, and saved it as an HTML page and then hosted it on, on, on GitHub. So that's definitely an option. All right, so in this next script right here, we're just, um, let's see here. So here we have 
all this information, I noted that the fill was maybe not as transparent as it could be. So let's change that a little bit. Sometimes I'll forget the direction of the transparency. So I'll start with 0.5 <laughs> and kind of go up or down accordingly. Um, but yeah, but we, we can, you know, render that and it will do the same thing again. And then our last step here is going to be overlaying something on top of this. So this is nice so far. Um, again, we're just plotting a map, so it probably doesn't seem that exciting. Um, but this is going to be the basis of a lot of work in the future. From here on out, we're going to work a lot with zip codes, but I wanted you to get familiar with census tracts because that is the ideal scale for a lot of a lot of analysis in public health, right? Um, census tracts tend to roughly approximate neighborhoods where you know better metrics may not be available. They're much smaller than zip codes, so there's a lot more variation that's possible, right? Um, that's really ideal. Um, sometimes you could be lucky and be able to work with an IRB where you can preserve that track level information, but usually that takes a lot of, um, of advocating on the behalf of the, the person doing the analysis. Um, all right, so we're going to read in the zip code, the zip code data. So these zip codes are coming directly from the city of Chicago data portal. Um, they may technically be zip code tabulation areas, but that's another can of worms I won't get into now. Okay. Um, all right, so let's look at this. I'm going to just pull this out here so we can look at it this way. Um, so here, when we're overlaying things, um, we're literally just going to lay things on top of each other. So we started off with this census tract information, right? We keep our um, we keep some of the cartographic style pieces here, but now we're going to add another layer. I want to take my census tracts and then I'm going to add zip codes on top of those census tracts. Um, and I'm going to color those new zip code boundaries with slightly thicker border in a different color um, so that it's just easier to look at, right? Um, let me see here. Here, we're going to first switch to this plot mode. All right, so we take the first layer, we add the second layer on top, meaning it's going to happen after this first TM shape. Um, and then um, I like to add the cartographic style at the very end just to kind of keep things a little bit um, simple. Okay. And so I should note here, we're going to come back to this a couple of times um, throughout uh, the workshop today, like the same kind of TM, TM map um, layering system. But here we can see that um, as you know, we have, you know, this, it's about 10 kilometers from there to there. We can see that there's a lot of census tracts within each zip code. And again, I just really wanted to highlight that, although we're often stuck with working with zip codes, it's probably not the best um, system because there's so much variation occurring below that level. Also note that there are going to be different standards for each type of geographic boundary and object. So for example, here we can see that the census tracts are kind of extending a little bit beyond the shoreline of Chicago. Um, and so this, whereas the zip code boundary seems to be really nicely cropped. Um, so there are ways to deal with this using GIS operations in R that aren't really are not that bad. Um, for our purposes, it's not a huge issue. But again, I just wanted to show you that just because you have a spatial um, a data set doesn't mean that it's 100% accurate in the way that you're expecting it to be. Okay, so um, that's essentially that for now. I include a few more resources. I'll just jump back here. Um, a few more resources for those of you who want to kind of dive into this a little bit more. I love the intro to the Geocomp Robin Lee, Robin Love, or the Geocomputation Tax by Lovelace et al. Um, it's hosted on, on Robin's um, GitHub. Um, so that's a really nice intro if you want to get more about spatial data basics. Um, the Geoda Center um, or our toolkit um, also has a pretty nice introduction that's going to be similar to what we already talked about. So if you just need a refresher on that. And then for projections, I include a couple of great um, tutorials. And then for TMAP, I, I give you a couple more. Okay. Um, but at this point, we're going to go back to um our next stage and at this point i'll i'll release back to susan do we want to take a break marnia um or or keep going any any votes from from participants 
um, in the, this is Mara, in the uh, workshop uh, message to attendees, we did say we'd do a five minute break every hour. Okay, so, so yeah, we're coming up on 11. So why don't we do a five minute break? Um, so should we come back? Um, let's just come back at 11.59. We'll get started at 11. Sounds great. Great. All right. See you all I, soon. Um, I'm going to pause the All right, everybody, welcome back. Let's get comfortable as we prepare to start. And yeah, I guess that's time. Um, all right, I'm going to switch to, and I, I should say, I've seen a lot of really, I, I can't see the chat at all while I'm presenting. There's a lot of really great questions. I should note, there is a lot of questions <laughs> that will come up in this, and it takes a while to kind of get familiar with, um, with, with some of the answers. So I really, really recommend, um, and I, I actually teach this in my classes, um, like, like teaching the art of Google searching. It's really, um, like getting the right search parameters is is tough, but I've learned that anytime anyone tells you this is a better way to do it, I can find three other cases where that might not be the best way. So I think learning to be flexible, um, and maybe one part will work, but you know, or one part might not work, but you should continue going to see if the other parts will work. Right? Um, I'll just, you know, I'll just throw that out there. But um, again, we'll we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but also, you know definitely use the phenomenal our spatial community that that exists out there um <laughs> for sure but we adapt we adapt or <laughs> extend <laughs> um okay so let's kick things off all right here i'm gonna come back to that in a second um and i will just really quickly note as well um in the background section of the workbook um if you go to the github page for sf if you do decide to try to install locally, there's a lot of really great tips there. So for those of you who are trying to do this um, on your own instance, feel free to go to that GitHub page um, that SF hosts and go through the common troubleshooting things of, of installing it. Installing it is nine times out of 10, the hardest part of, um, if there are hiccups, it might be there. But um, again, for this workshop, you're probably working in our studio cloud and that's not an issue. Okay, but let's kick things off from there. Thank you, Marinia. Um, so in this next section, um, we're going to build off what we did in the intro where we, you know, we just got intro to some of the basics of spatial data and what we're talking about when we talk about spatial analysis in R. Um, we created a couple of maps using the different projections to see the difference um, of like what a different projection and CRS can uh, generate. And then we also started building this map that we're going to build off of looking at the city of Chicago. Um, uh, but the map that we created was really simple, right? It was just in gray. We were really just looking at the borders of first the census tracts, um, and then we overlaid the zip code boundaries. Um, we saw that one map that was just the gray outline uh, or just sort of the gray um, polygon of the city of Chicago. And so now we're going to look into how do we um, build off of those maps and create maps that uh, thematically map places. Um, and in this case, we're more, our lab is really interested in neighborhoods of, of the context of actually where people live. So we will look a lot at the na at neighborhood level data. So that's what we're going to look at in this section. Um, and what that, uh, the main concept that that introduces is this uh, idea of thematic mapping, which is um, also referred to as chloropleth mapping. Um, in the GIS and spatial world, you see chloropleth very often, but once you get out of that world, uh, that word often throws people off. So thematic mapping is just another way of, of describing the same thing. Um, so thematic or chloropleth maps um, are maps that we are all familiar with, um, really. Um, whether or not we use them in our, you know, use them and or see them in work um, in the in the medical or health field, but also just we see them all the time in the news and politics. They're used everywhere to represent quantitative data through colors or patterns or shading sometimes in different geographic areas. 
So here, um, the map that we the, the map presented here as an example of a chloroplast map. This is just a little um, snapshot of the southeastern United States. Um, uh, the the different units there you see are U.S. counties, um, and this shows uh, U.S. Uh, I, I forget even what rate it is, what what data it's representing, but it's kind of irrelevant here. But it's showing a different data. Um, it, classified an equal interval classification with five bins. So what that means is what that refers to are the different ways that you can classify and then thematically map data. Um, so there's the data classification method, and then there's the number of classes or bins that you use within that classification method. So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna highlight a few of the many options that we can use to classify data um, in a mapping and visualization context. So we're gonna generate each of these maps um, in, in the tutorial ahead. So first, um, the different data classification methods can arrange your data in different ways using different boundaries to separate uh, data classes. So for example, in a quantile map, Data is grouped into, uh, again, we use the words class or bin kind of interchangeably, but data is grouped into classes that each have the same number of observations. So uh, if you, if you, you know, if you're binning data into three different groups or three classes, it's technical, technically called a tertile map, four classes is a quartile map, five classes is a quintile map, and so on. Um, so as you can see here, this is a map of um, the city of Chicago using COVID case rate data. Um, again, we'll, we'll be using, we'll be looking at some of this similar data in the tutorial coming up, but it's grouped by, this is a, this is a quintile map grouped in five different, uh, uh, five different bins. So here you can see that this is the same data set, but the map looks slightly different. Um, so this map was is a natural breaks map. Um, uh, natural breaks is also sometimes referred to as a Jenks map. Um, Jenks was the um, uh, was the as the scientist that uh, developed this method for for data classification. Um, so in a natural breaks map, data is grouped so that the within group homogeneity is maximized. So this can mean that in contrast to the quantile map. The number of observations in each class might be highly different. Um, so, uh, for example, you see here the darkest color, um, the darkest color purple um, or maroon on the map on the sort of left side of the city, west side of the city of Chicago is the highest, has the highest uh, COVID case rate at this snapshot at that point in time. Um, and there's only, it looks like there's like four zip codes that have that, um, that are in that category. But then you see like one of the lighter blues, there's, you know, 10 plus zip codes in the city of Chicago that's in that classification. So you can see the different number of, it's not about the number of observations in each class, but it's about maximizing that within group homogeneity of the data as you classify it. Hence the term natural breaks of the data. And lastly, we'll be looking at today um, the standard deviation map. So again, this is just a different way of visualizing your data. Um, standard deviation in particular is very useful for helping to identify outliers. This, you know, this is the same concept of in you know, more classic statistics. Um, and so in this, in this in standard deviation map, the variable of interest um, is transformed into standard deviational units so covering the range from the lowest to highest, so showing uh, which, which uh, in this case, zip codes are two uh, units of uh, two standard deviations above the mean or 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 one or below the mean as well. Um, so we'll we'll look at this data. It doesn't look that different because we're just looking at the city of Chicago right now, but this can often yield a very radically different map um, versus the quantile or natural breaks map. So if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to highlight, um, we're gonna look at those three maps. We're gonna generate those three maps today, but there are 
several other data classification methods that are commonly used and that you might be interested in knowing about or using in your work. Um, but there's equal intervals, which is pretty self-explanatory, but it's classifying the data into equal intervals. Um, so again, that's uh, it might be different number of observations within each interval, but the data might be cleaner presented in that way. Um, there's manual intervals, which again, those are the intervals that you can set um, and, and predetermine um, to show data in a way that, that might be more appropriate. Um, and then there's also a box map or box plot, which is again, another way of, uh, of showing the data kind of similar to a quantile map where it's identifying the interquartile range of the data, but then um, above and below that range, it's identifying the upper outlier and lower outlier. So again, these are all just different maps. And here we see graphs that are visualizing the data um, showing those showing those different uh, classification methods. And next, please. So those are these three, here are these three city of Chicago maps of the quantile, natural breaks, and standard deviation maps. Um, choosing the best one for your data is, is definitely not a precise uh, or exact science all the time. Um, it often takes exploration um, it often takes some trial and error and looking at your data in different ways. Um, whichever method is best is really going to depend on your data and also the questions and answers that you're trying to investigate and the findings that you're trying to convey. Another factor in this might be the audience that you're trying to, uh, that you're sharing this information with. Um, so this is why we really like this, as Mernia mentioned before, the process of exploratory spatial data analysis, which is the which in which we look at maps really at the beginning, um, that look at data and maps in different ways in the beginning of the research process, and then at the end as well um, as as an investigative method um, and making sure that you know we're we're considering looking at the data in different ways before uh, choosing which one is most appropriate. Um, so with that, hopefully those will, that will be some helpful context as we dive in um, a little bit more. And I think that's it for me. I'll, ha I'll pass it back over to Marinia and dive into the code. And I will note here that there is also like, there'll be a very um, how do I say this? Oftentimes I find um, the health community goes to quantile maps immediately, um, but that's often not the most, um, like if there's such a thing as correct, that's not often not, not the most correct according to most data that's out there. And there's a lot of different limitations that come with that. So it's another really important part of, um, yeah, of doing what we're doing here. Okay, so we're going to go back to sharing the screen. And for those of you who didn't hear me earlier, again, um, if you have more specific questions about SF, check out their GitHub. That will be really useful for you for, um, for a lot of different pieces. But before um, I get into the more more details there, I also wanted to talk about like, you know, why would we, why, why would we, why would, or kind of extending what Susan talked about already, like why would we be mapping neighborhoods? And this workbook is following kind of this you know, thought experiment of a, a case that you might do, your, you know, yourself. So um, we're interested in, you know, the health of people, but that is going to necessitate some thinking about na the neighborhood environment, right? And so when you're looking at a neighborhood, that could be the neighbor population level health outcomes at that neighborhood level, that could be premature mortality at the census tract scale or cumulative COVID rates by zip code. So we're going to use cumulative COVID rates for a week in September um, as our example. Um, but then also sometimes we're interested in like what may be associated with that, um, that might be explaining or driving the, the disparities. So that could be neighborhood factors like poverty, access to affordable housing, distance to nearest health provider, um, distance to pollution emitting facilities. 
Um, so these are the quote unquote social determinants of health at the neighborhood scale that are increasingly urgent in modern public health thinking. And these are thought to drive and or reinforce or magnify racial, social, and spatial inequities. So oftentimes when we're looking at the neighborhood level environment, we're looking for those inequities essentially, um, because if there is no inequity, um, you'll have a spatially random map, right? There won't be any obvious patterns, but oftentimes we see um, geographic correlation between these different terms, and that's going to lead us um, to more sophisticated thinking um, and hypothesis generation and that sort of thing. So again, we start with the choropleth mapping just to kind of get a, um, a grounding of what we need to do. So I'll go back to my environment, um, and we're going to switch to um, our choropleth map. So in this case, we're going to be pulling um, CSV data. These, this, is, this came straight from the data portal. And it is, as you might expect, um, for data portal uh, data, a little, uh, you know, it's not in the format that we need it for, for our analysis. So we have a zip code, we have a week number, week start, week end, a lot of different um, parameters. Notice how super, super long the column names are. That's, that's usually a no-no in spatial analysis um, because we come from the days of data storage uh, or there's limited data storage. So you, like, for example, the, a shape file requires, I think, no more than 10 character attribute names, right? But again, a lot of this kind of epi work will be done outside of that. So you'll find, you know, this is, this is pretty similar data. This data set also has a zip code location um, but if you look at it, you shouldn't trust it, right? This is zip code level data, and this is being indicated as a point. And look, two of the points are identical. Um, so, um, so it could be the same zip code, but zip codes are not represented as points, they're represented as polygons. Um, I'll give you a hint, it's probably the centroid of the zip code. But again, we're not interested in the centroids of the zip codes, we're interested in mapping actual neighborhoods. So. Um, again, just be cautious and skeptical whenever you're working with data. Um, so this data is in what is known as the long format, where every single row is corresponding to some, you know, health outcomes at a different time period. Okay, um, that means that the same zip code will be repeated multiple times. Um, that's useful for some type, some type of analysis, but in our analysis, that doesn't work. We spatial analysis doesn't um, make sense with long format data, we need to shift to wide format data um, for, for a lot of work, not, not all work, but for a lot of work. And what that means is, you know, each zip code will be a separate row. And if you want to retain the temporal data, that would be represented as different columns, okay? So if you do want to do spatial temporal analysis, it would need to, in, in, in some GIS systems, it would need to get converted into that way. For our purposes, we're just trying to kind of get familiar with things. So our goal is going to just extract one week of data and then just use that subset for our work, okay? So first, um, how, many, how many weeks are in the data, okay? Uh, let's see here. All right, actually, let's do week number. I think that might be an error. Okay, so it seems that there are 40 weeks in this data. Okay, so again, if, if you get a different result on that, that's not a huge deal. This is essentially just, we we're trying to understand what are the total number of weeks just to get an idea of what we're working with. And then our goal is going to be just to subset and inspect one week. So I've decided let's subset and inspect one week, week 39. And week 39, we can see starts from September 20th and it goes through September 26th. We're going to be interested in the case cumulative rate. This can be a really useful um, tool when looking at spatial temporal trends for COVID specifically um, because of, I mean, the because is, is a long reason, and we can chat about that at the very end. But for example, um, so Susan and I uh, helped lead up the US COVID Atlas, um, where we've been doing spatial temporal mapping of COVID since last March or March 2020. Um, and so just looking at a cumulative rate 
is going to give you some idea of, of what's happening, especially by this point in September. So we're we're taking it as it is. Um, we're not saying it's anything more than it is as well. Um, so we're going to just subset and inspect. Notice, so so those of you who are tidy users, you may have you may have audibly gasped at how I'm subsetting. Um, and again, so I, I promise that I was providing information here in a very, very basic way. But if you want to show off your tidy skills, this is a great place to do it. So you could either show off those tidy skills, reshape that whole data set, um, or you can just, you know, use it to subset it in a different way. There are a million different ways to work with the attribute piece. So that's totally up to you. Um, but at this point now we're going to have um, data for zip codes. Uh, let's see what the dimension of our data set is. So we have 60 zip codes um, in our data set. Okay. All right. So we're going to keep on going here. So let's clean up our data a little bit. Um, for our purposes, let's say we just want to include the zip code ID and then the variable of interest. Again, several of you might be audibly gasping because, you know, it's so long, you want to rename it. Um, you could have just pulled this all together up here. That's totally fine. But again, I'm just trying to show you the very basics so that you, it can be flexible according to how each of you have your own, like I want to respect each of your own ecosystems and give you that chance to update if you need to. Um, so here we have uh, kind of a slightly cleaned up data set. The zip code is listed as a factor. Um, and the case rate is, is included as a double. All right, at this point, we're ready to merge. Um, we're going to merge this data set with our master shape, uh, shape file that's at the zip code level. So if you need to, um, you can reload your zip code. If you're working in one straight session, obviously you don't need to reload it, but that's just something to consider. And um, before we join, we have to make sure that we know what we're joining on. So this is the trickiest part of merges. So we have, um, on one hand, the COVID data is going to have the key zip.code like that. And then our other, our master shape file that we're merging to is going to have zip as a lowercase. OK, so um, here we're using merge. I've been finding that merge can be very buggy, um, but I'll just, that'll be for another discussion. Um, so here we have our spatial file. Remember, we always want to merge data to the spatial file. The spatial file is our master file. That's what we're merging everything to. You know, later on, we can out or, or write that master file um, to a CSV. We want to just include that, like the attribute information, but always, always, Start with your spatial file and then merge non-spatial data to that. Okay, so we take our spatial file, we take our COVID um, subset. Um, on the left-hand side, so the zip file is going to have a key of lowercase zip, and then the the COVID data will have that information. So we're um, I, this one up here that I, I X'd out, I would like to do that, but that creates issues later on. Um, and I might've gotten my, uh, yeah, that, that's that's for a later discussion. But for now, um, this, this is going to be much more workable for you in following sections. So here we have, again, each zip code and it's the same spatial file, right? It still has that object ID, area, length, geometry, but now we've also added this field right here of case rate cumulative. Okay, so starting with the classic epi approach, we're going to look at our data as quantiles. I already noted that this is not my favorite method, um, but it's the most common. <laughs> I think it's mainly because there's, you know, there should be equal number of observations in each one. One thing I will tell you, um, ties, so if you have many, many, many um, values that are zeros or ones, or if you have a lot of um, data that has the same value, quantile maps don't really work well with ties at all. And if you don't check for that, you may have wildly different observations in each group. Um, and again, quantile maps don't really care about the actual, like the, the, the distribution or like the clustering within, um, like the Jenks maps do. So to just be really cautious when you're working with quantile maps. Okay, so we're going to start there though. We're going to use our favorite, you know, initial mapping library, the TMAP library, 
And um, what we're going to do here is just add another uh, parameter called the style or called style. So here in style, we can specify what type of map we want to make. And if you look up the documentation, it can either be under TM polygons or TM fill. You'll find it in both. Um, you'll see what the options are that are that are available to you. It turns out there's many different options. We're going to just look at three. So we're going to, um, you know, take our zip codes, plot the COVID case rate number, um, style it with the quantile map. And here we get to use a palette of my favorite palette, Boo Poo, B-U-P-U. -U. It's like blue purple. Um, there are a lot of different gorgeous um, color palettes out there. So Color Brewer, um, it turns out I mean, there's a whole art and science to choosing color palettes. It has to be pleasing to the eye. You might have to be thinking about um, if you if you want it to be ADA accessible, right? So having reds and greens is a big no-no if um, if if that might not work for, like that that won't work for a public community, for example. Um, and and so so thinking about palettes is really complex. And then Color Brewer is a really um, if you just look up the Color Brewer library online, that's like a little app that will let you explore different colors. And then it turns out if you just Google our Color Brewer palettes, you'll find um, all the different palettes that are available to you as an image. If you want to go the hardcore way, load the R Color Brewer library, use that function, and you'll see all that as well. But um, I think that just Googling it can be a little bit faster. <laughs> all right, so let's map this. And here we go. So here we have quantiles. And so, you know, what does this tell us? So I didn't tell it what type of numbers I wanted to, um, how many bins I wanted. So it gives me automatically five bins. Um, O'Hare, this one zip code didn't have data. Um, I can see that there definitely seems to be anomalously higher um, COVID case rates on this west side of the city. And also this one really tiny zip code in the downtown area. Um, Remember when you're working with aerial data, it's there's a visual distortion happening where smaller areas are usually smaller because there's higher population, so there's more people there. Um, but they're visually smaller, so they don't seem as important. But again, um, keep an, keep your eye on that to see how that how that is affected. Um, but you know, um, what we can see with this initial one is that it's not randomly distributed throughout the the map here. Um, that suggests there is clustering behavior happening. Um, that's not a statistical decision yet. I'm just observing that there might be some sort of clustering, which might make sense for an infectious, um, you know, thing. <laughs> All right, so let's try tur um, turtles or turtiles. Turtles. Um, I've seen a lot of turtiles or turtles in, in academic journals lately, and you can see here it it does not the best job in capturing the. You know, it is doing a job. But um, we're starting to lose the nuance of you know places where there might be a slightly more intensive COVID being experienced. So keep that in mind. Um, so next, we can try the um, uh, standard deviation map. And again, um, I'm not going to go through all the documentation of TMAP. That's for you to check out if you're interested in this um, to, to really understand like which uh, standard deviation measure is occurring at each one. Um, we also, our group also uses Geoda a lot, and um, Geoda also, like, they they visualize the breaks a little bit differently so that it's more clear what the standard deviation breaks are, but here you probably need to um, double and triple check to, to make sure that you're, you feel solid about it. Okay, but we're looking at this map, and again, here the intensity definitely seems to be occurring across these four zip codes on the west side. It seems to, um, having this area of slightly less COVID between these two hotter areas is important because that suggests that this might be very vulnerable, right, um, to COVID because you have rates increasing in two areas. If you just look at it like this, you're treating all of those areas the same way, whereas the actual vulnerability is probably pretty different. Um, and here you can see that tiny little um, zip code in downtown is maybe more vulnerable than the highest numbers. Okay, so finally, let's try the Jinx map. Um, the Jinx map is all like another way of thinking about it is it's like almost doing a univariate clustering algorithm on the data to look for like the groups within. So we're going to start with that. And here, um, 
the reason that we want to do maps multiple times like this and try different data classification techniques is because real trends persist. If it's a real trend, I'll see it in every map, um, whereas um, otherwise we're not sure if how if the method is actually artificially, you know, is is the observation coming from an artifact of the method or is it coming from the actual data we have to always think about and re wrestle with that with that bias so here we again see those fours that codes show up so i feel really confident that those like that, that's that's a real trend that's occurring and that there is that dip between those two areas and here again we do see um, that downtown section again um but if we look at this a little bit further one thing i'm not super excited about is this lower field, 385 to 385. There's not that much variation there. Um, and it looks like there's just one <laughs> group where that belongs to, which, which is not super great. So let's try four bins instead of five bins to see if that takes care of that. Okay, so now we see that this lone guy down here joins this category right here. Um, and that's pretty helpful, okay? And so here I've also, added something a little bit, you know, I, so he, in these existing maps, we have the map and um, the legend populates automatically, but here I've added, what, a histogram. So this is, again, the fun of TMAP. Um, when I first found this, I, I, I made, made sounds. I was so excited about it. Um, so this is simply just another parameter um, that goes in your um, TFIL T or T, TM polygon um, call where you're simply saying the legend dot histogram equals true it's automatically on false but if you switch it to true you're going to get a gorgeous histogram that shows you how the data is distributed and you can see from this histogram that this group of four they're notably above that that kind of the next group so there's something really unique happening there um, here also just by looking at different tmap you know examples out there and that sort of thing um, I have um, added the scale bar, but I've also pushed the legend outside of the map. Um, and this is a really neat trick where um, instead of cluttering your map, and it will get cluttered in TMAP if you have everything falling on top of each other, you can just push it out of the map and then that looks really nice. Um, all right, so at this point, um, we're pretty happy with that. Um, but, it, you know, we might actually want to integrate more data, right? So this is just COVID data, but there's a lot of other data that, you know, even as we're talking about it, hypothesizing, is there something uniquely different about this part of the city than other parts of the city? Like, what's, like, what are some of the potential drivers of, of the patterns that we see, right? So we want to bring in more data. Um, here, I'm going to be bringing in data that's already cleaned. Um, <laughs> which makes uh, life a lot easier from the opiate environment policy scan database. Um, maybe I'll ask Susan to talk a little bit more about that um, in a you know 30 second spiel um, as she as she does the next one. Um, but this is something else that our group produced. Um, the um, the GitHub IO is linked in the workbook, but essentially this includes dozens and dozens and dozens of variables that, that represent social, economic, policy, um, uh, sense, you know, many different aspects of um, uh, that reflects the social determinants of health that may impact um, specifically justice populations and persons um, with um, opioid use disorder. Um, but that en ends up being just about every, you know, a lot of the, the factors that influence that also influence a lot of other um, disease <laughs> in, 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 in challenges. So, um, so we're going to pull from that. Um, I'll, yeah, I, I don't want it. We're starting to fall a little bit behind on time. So I'll, I'll maybe share a link or I'll, I'll take you to the site a little bit later, but essentially here, we're going to pull in a data set that is just one report. So one report that comes from this, um, this is from the 2018 American Community Survey, we have for every zip code, um, a whole breakdown of racial, ethnic, age ranges, um, some, uh, so here is you no know, high school diploma. Um, here we have um, over 65 um, and then, you know, also younger groups, which might be 
um, interesting and useful for different analysis, as well as percent disabled. Okay, so this is a, a clean data set. Again, it would be a whole other tutorial to go through the data cleaning, but um, but here it is. So we're going to now merge this to our data set. Okay, so we merge again. Just and again, we have to be careful about our keys. So our master data set has the lowercase zip, and in, in this example, it's a ZCTA, which is zip code tabulation area. Um, so we're going to look at that. And now we see we still have the cumulative year, but now we've added a lot of other information. Okay. Sometimes when I merge, it does this thing where it splits into X's and Y's. That doesn't always happen. Um, so I, I don't know what to tell you guys. It didn't do it earlier today, but um, <laughs> we're going to come back to that in a second. So if this happens for you, um, then we might have to just add a dot X or a dot Y a little bit later. Okay. All right. So here we're going to create a thematic map panel. Um, we're going to essentially take a very simple case rate map using Jinx, the blue, uh, the blue purple palette, uh, four bins, give it a title, take out the frame, but then we're going to also replicate and do the exact same thing for several other variables, because we want to think about like, what are the potential drivers, right? What are the potential disparities that are existing? So disparities, you might think about racial disparities. Is the burden the same between Black, Hispanic, um, white populations in Chicago? Um, but you might also want to think, you know, is it race or racism? which is the direction that um, you know, thinking is, is fortunately moving. So now you wanna think more about what are some of the contextual um, population-based um, observations that we can find. So for example, are there parts of the city that have disproportionately more seniors, um, which happens in Chicago and many other places, either because um, of high economic dis uh, disparity where folks move and the ones that remain maybe very old and very young, very vulnerable, or it could be more of a Arizona, Florida phenomenon where seniors are intentionally moving into places, right, um, for a different type of retirement experience. So in either case, this may, um, we know that that was a population that was disproportionately impacted by COVID, so maybe we want to look at that. But then also we may want to look at um, no high school, uh, diploma just as one of many, many different kind of social economic indicators. So we're going to do this. I actually don't think this will work the first time the way that I have it set up because of these X's and Y's. <sighs> so um, I'm going to just quickly troubleshoot and just add an X to each of these. Again, you have to think on your feet and many times um, in, in my experience working with this, what works fine one time may not work a little bit later and just restarting my session can fix a lot of stuff so just keep that in mind okay but it did render correctly which is wonderful and here we see our maps okay so um and again this can get you can you can continue to refine and update this so i because of that really long covid name i renamed that um, COVID rate, and you can use this same kind of coding snippet to, to name the other variables accordingly. Um, but here we can see some pretty interesting things, like there are some striking geographic correlations between potentially between um, COVID rate and then where the um, Latinx Hispanic community is existing, as well as, um, you know, as well as other features. So again, we have to move beyond um, I think I have some some work here about that, right? Um, in modern spatial epidemiology, associations must never be taken at face value. We know it's not race, but racism um, and other isms that drive multiple health disparities. Simply looking at a specific group is not enough, um, especially in spatial analysis. We want to look at the spatial disparities, right? We want to explore multiple variables and nurture curiosity to understand these intersections. Um, so kind of keep that in mind, right? And um, so, and again, this is just a snapshot of what where COVID was for one week in September. As you can imagine, that shifted dramatically um, before and after and since. So there's, this is an ongoing thing. Um, but then also, as you're looking at this, 
hopefully you're, you know, intrigued and thinking like, huh, I wonder if it's that or I, I wonder if it's this. So this, this is essentially where you are, are going to pivot to think about what are some other variables that you need to bring in to refine your approach. Maybe you want to bring in essential workers. Maybe you want to bring in a different age group. So um, specifically in Chicago, a lot of the Hispanic Latinx community is very, very young, um, which is interesting, right? Because um, we know there were different um, school challenges in different communities um, last last year. So maybe looking at um, percentage families or percentage young children. What about internet access? Right? Um, how did in access to internet in influence these things? So um, and on the other hand, we also know that comorbidities were pretty important in, in this field. So you could also look to uh, something like the Chicago Health Atlas or work with your own clinic to pull in data like um, on asthma, hypertension, and other data at the same or similar um, scale to, to start to compare side by side. And I just wanted to emphasize again that this is really meant as an exploratory investigative type of phase. If you have already decided what you think is important or if you're only care about one variable, then this approach is, you know, it tends to kind of unravel that pretty quickly. Um, okay, and then at the very end here, um, you can write to your spatial file of choice. I will note, I have found that the drivers in SF can be a little bit buggy. So those of you who are passionate about um, package development, <laughs> you should chat about that. Um, but another thing that I can do that's pretty fool foolproof is just write your final um, zip code merged information to a CSV. Um, which is much less likely to have any bugs or issues. And then you can just rejoin that CSV in a, in a different session if needed. Okay, but at this point, let's start the next chapter and then we'll take our break again. Perfect. Um, let's see, Marnia, do you wanna share your, or I can share my screen actually, doesn't matter. Um, why don't I do? Oh, she got it. There we go. Perfect. So in this next section, um, now that we've, you know, generated chlorocleth maps, um, plotting data by, uh, by community area, um, by neighborhood. In this case, we're looking at the zip codes in Chicago. Um, now we can start to add additional resources um, and bring in additional data variables to our data set and to, to our maps. So um, next slide. Um, we're, I'm just gonna give an overview of geocoding because we're going to be adding um, some point data um, in the context of this, invest, this exploratory investigation that we're doing and looking at um, in Chicago, we're gonna be adding um, we're going to be looking at the intersection uh, of the COVID pandemic and uh, the opioid crisis in the United States, specifically in Chicago. There have been a lot of intersections of these two uh, public health crises um, over, over the past year and a half. Um, and one dimension that our lab um, does a lot of research and thinking about is um, how um, what does access to resources for opioid use disorder look like um, at the neighborhood or community level? And then, of course, in the last year and a half of COVID, how has that been impacted and exasperated by COVID as most all facets of life have been impacted in some way, but specifically um, how, how does COVID intersect with community access to opioid use disorder um, treatment and opioid use disorder rates. So we look a lot at access to treatment. So we're gonna be geocoding um, point data um, using the addresses of methadone clinics in the city of Chicago. Um, this is real data. Um, it's data that we pulled from the uh, SAMHSA, uh, which is the Substance Abuse and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is the administration in the US that oversees at the federal level a lot of the um, drug treatment um, and uh, mental health resources. So we're going to be geocoding these points. Uh, at the foundational level, what is the process of geocoding? 
So geocoding is terminology that we use a lot, um, and we use this process a lot in, in spatial data science and spatial analysis. This is the process of converting addresses, um, so, so like residential addresses, street addresses, into actual geographic coordinates using a known coordinate reference system. So again, that CRS is really important here in the geocoding process because we're basically taking a piece of text and translating that into an actual location and a point in space. So then we can use those coordinates, which are um, usually latitude, longitude coordinates to spatially enable data. So again, the input is usually an address um, so it's a, a piece of a, a text address, um, and in, in our case, it's going to be the address of different methadone clinics, and the output is we're going to get latitude and longitude coordinates for our specific CRS that we're using. Next slide. So in R, um, ge uh, geocoding is actually... Um, it's actually pretty easy in R. I don't want to say it's too easy, because of course we run into issues all the time, but um, this package is really does make it really simple and easy to geocode um, if you have all of your address information. So um, we love the tidy geocoder package um, and it's pretty consistent and generates usually pretty pretty good results in in accuracy and precision. So with the tidy geocoder package, um, we uh, you start by reading in your CSV or text file with your addresses. So we'll see here that we have the address uh, column in this data set. That's like four four five three North Broadway, Chicago, Illinois, and then the zip code. Um, so we're going to read that in an R um, into a data frame. In the next slide. After that, um, we're going to be doing a little bit of cleaning and preparing the data because to put it into um, the format at which the tidy geocoder package and the geocode um, function can read. But we'll be doing some cleaning and preparing of the data and then using the geocode um, function here in dark blue. Um, we'll use that to geocode the addresses to generate the latitude and longitude coordinates um, for our specific C uh, CRS and that methadone clinics um, uh, data set has already been projected into our into uh, a CRS. We'll, we'll see that in the in the tutorial. And then using that uh, geocoded uh, clinics, uh, uh, data set will be transforming or converting that to a spatially enabled data set, um, which we'll call methadone SF. Um, but we'll, that for to do that, we'll be using the ST as SF function and transforming that into um, spatially enabled data that will then be able to plot on the map. Um, and next slide, please. So again, after the addresses have been cleaned, geocoded, and then spatially enabled, they can then be added as a point layer on a map. And here we see um, methadone clinics portrayed. This is, again, just a very simple map, but shown as points overlaid on the COVID case rate data. So we'll be walking through um, how to do that in the tutorial in the next section. And I think, well, why don't we take our five minute break now. Um, so set your alarms and come back in five minutes. That'll be about uh, 11 50, 54 a.m. Central Time US, 12 54 p.m. Eastern Time US. Um, so set your clocks and we'll be back and see you in five.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I think we're still recording. Um, so um, just to sum up, if you're just joining us, we just talked about thematic mapping of neighborhoods and we just uh, did an overview of geocoding data. Um, and there's a great discussion in the chat about CRS and <laughs> projections and uh, where CRS is, is needed in the geocoding um, steps. So I think we'll dive right into that and I'll hand it over to Marinia to bring us to R. Oh, you're still muted, Marinia. Okay. All right, so lots of great questions for sure. Um, you guys are on top of it. Um, yes, so, okay, talking more about uh, what Susan was just saying. So I think a lot of times clinicians think of, of the only time they might wanna geocode something are patients, and that ends up being complicated for a number of different reasons. But I'm really encouraging everyone to also think about all the other things that exist in our world as locations. So how do we use point locations for different types of um, spatial epi research? Well, we can think about health providers, hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, you know, all that stuff. We'll be talking about medication for um, OUD here today. Um, this can be translated into distance to nearest or distance to the, um, the hospital as a way to um, mitigate, you know, if someone is living closer or further away from a hospital, is that potentially confounding um, some of the health out outcomes that you're seeing, right? Um, but also area resources. So if you're interested or need to kind of control for, um, well, your patients are coming from different places. Some will have more or fewer grocery stores, playgrounds, daycare centers, schools, etc. cetera. Um, they're um, being able to, to, to digitize that as, as location information is going to be very useful for a lot of different things. But then also area challenges. So um, crimes, crimes are often included as um, addresses or lat longs already, um, but also things like super fun sites, you know, pollution emitting facilities. That's the correct way of, of, of saying it. I don't wanna just say factory because a lot of different buildings can and do emit pollution. Um, so that comes from the national emissions inventory. So, you know, points obviously can also represent people and that's what a lot of the chat was on fire about, right? Well, you guys want to um, geocode your patients as soon as possible. And obviously the locations of individuals is protected health information. So here lies, um, I mean, a, a good open source toolkit is not gonna use the same exact a tool for everything, right? You want to broaden your toolkit. So um, geocoding patients specifically may be something that exists in a different element that you then bring into um, something like this. So I just wanted to, to note that. Um, that being said, um, if, um, if and when you have access to those individual locations, you can work in a, you know, work with that patient level data in a secure environment under an IRB board. Um, or under their approval and that sort of thing. Um, and I'll give a few hints of, you know, the geocoding piece specifically, but please note that geocoding is separate than working with the actual data. Um, you may need to get a different um, geocoding service that is outside of R. Um, however, you once you get those locations from a geocoding service, you may be able to use R in an offline secure environment um, to do initial, uh, some of the additional data wrangling that I'll, I'll be showing you for the rest of today. Okay, so in this example, we're going to start with addresses of a few methadone maintenance um, services in Chicago. For those of you who don't know, it's one of um, the few, the very few evidence-based medications to reduce um, mortality from um, opioid overdose. And um, so that's why we're talking about it today. There's all sorts of policy challenges, but that's a different discussion. Um, and, uh, oh, I found a, ignore that little extra E in there. So we start with addresses, which are characters. We need to change that character into some coordinate system. And um, that process of turning it into a coordinate is going to require a, co a you know, a, a coordinate reference system. And that is all going to be supplied to us through a geocoding service. So we're using the tidy geocoder to get ours done. Um, but because this requires an API, you obviously can't use this for HIPAA protected data. Um, for offline geocoders, there are a lot of different options out there. Um, please be wary of, you know, consultants who promise 
I don't know, or pro promise a lot, <laughs> not deliver as much. Um, if you are working with a group that is pretty technologically savvy, um, from our team, we recommend Polias. It's an open source a geocoder that you can actually have a local install on so you can kind of create your own geocoding service um, using Polias. Um, I believe MapZen, the folks from MapZen, which is a really big um, startup, moved to or transformed to Polias. So this is a really phenomenal service. If, if you feel that that is something that your team can do, um, it has kind of a Docker installation and that sort of thing. So that's doable. They also have a version where you can ping the cloud, but obviously if you're building your own offline geocoder to comply with HIPAA, then you'd have to um, go a different route and, and do that local installation. And the way that geocoding works is essentially you have a network topology of all the streets in the US and each street has a lot of information attached to it, including addresses. So it's converting the address as character to a specific place on that street network uh, topology. Oh, can you guys see my screen? I got a weird message that now you are able to, but hopefully you've been able to for a while. Um, we can see the polias, but... Perfect, okay, yeah, no, that's okay. right. Okay, yeah. yeah, so, but essentially, um, so the way geocoding works is that you're working with a street network topology. Uh, street network topologies are very, um, the census offers one for free. It's not that great, which is why the results of geocoding are not always the best. Google Maps has spent billions. I mean, I don't know if billions. They've spent a lot of money on improving their network topology. Look up the Ground Truthing Project from 2013-14. That's why their routing is so good because they spent a lot. But again, there are other versions. So Polias is one. They use a street network topology that you can locally install and then um, search addresses that way. That topology itself has a coordinate reference system in, in place, which is why you're getting the coordinates from that. Um, but then in addition to that, some of the more conventional options are going to be um, Esri. So like, for example, our group, like, you know, we could use Polias, but our library offers um, Esri geocoding, both online and offline. So that is, you know, that might be a specific contract. And you, when you're working with um, folks in this area, be very specific about what your needs are, um, have an idea of how many, um, you know, addresses you'll need to geocode, how often, is it a couple thousand, is it a couple million, these are things that you have to really think about, um, but again, that might be a specific investment, and, and that's, that's okay. All right, but let, that being said, let's switch over to geocoding um, as we are. And because it's already noon, I'm going to do a little bit more on the just rendering side versus um, console side, um, just because I want to leave some room for questions. So we're loading in our library. We're going to read in a new data set that we haven't worked with yet. And this is just a CSV that has name, um, address, city, state, zip. This is what a lot of data is going to look like. Um, these this data came from SAMHSA initially, which is, uh, or you can just look up the acronym. Um, this is going to be publicly available information about where um, some um, uh, methadone maintenance locations exist. However, whether or not they're actually open or accepting clients is another story. So that potentially would be a separate analysis is um, looking into that and updating this data set further. Um, at this point, you never want to throw all of your data at a geocoder at one time. You start with one. You start with one example. So here, we just manually type in, um, you know, this 2020, 2020, 60 Elston Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'm not even including the zip code here, which is not great, but um, it, it it still works. Um, here, we're using the cascade method within Tidy Geocoder. That is actually going to ping first the US Census. And then if the census doesn't return a, a latitude longitudinal, then ping OpenStreetMap. Um, so more sophisticated geocoders will also give you match percentages or map criteria to tell you like what is the likelihood that that is a real match. Um, that's, again, another discussion, but you can easily find out information about that if you search it online. But in this case, we're assuming if we get a latitude longitude, we're fine. Um, next, we really want to um, do some data cleaning 
to work with this data set to prepare it for geocoding. And that's the same thing you have to do for any API service, right? So check out the documentation of your geocoding or whatever API you're working with and get your data in the right format. So we can see, um, because I just use the very basic read.csv and not some of the other options out there, most of the data um, that should be a character is listed as a factor. So I'm going to change all of uh, the address, city, state, zip to a character. And I'm also going to paste them together. So we just have one line, one attribute, the full address to push into the geocoding service. And that's pretty common for geocoding services. Um, so we're going to do that here. And at that point, we're ready to go. So um, you click on it. There's um, not that many clinics, so um, it takes a couple seconds. Um, but again, the services are really going to differ depending on your internet connection, um, the efficiency of the code behind that you may not see um, of the function and, and that sort of thing. But we've had pretty good luck with this one for publicly um, you know, available data. All right, so we have this information. If we look at it, we can see here that there are two that did not geocode properly. We're getting NA values. So we can never convert null values to coordinates. And in fact, um, SF won't let us. SF will give us an error if we try to push something. Um, if we push this data as is to a spatial object, we will get an error saying, you know, hey, sorry, I can't change null values to coordinate systems. So we have to make a decision. This is a workshop, so we're going to take, you know, the easy way out <laughs> and just omit it. Um, or, I mean, and even more dramatically, like, omit and anything with, with null values. Um, but in a, in a proper kind of environment, you should inspect further and start to determine, like, is there a pattern? Are the nulls happening um, only in some places and not others? Um, I've worked a lot with medical examiner data, and you'll have six or seven different medical examiner data having six or seven different ways of recording their data. So um, sometimes it's worth to um, really try to understand what's happening there. Um, in an extreme situation, you might actually have to, you know, search this address, um, go to, you know, um, go to Google Maps, search it, because again, they have the best, though, proprietary um, network topology. And then um, there is an option of what's here. I think if you right click anywhere on a Google map, that option comes up as well. And then you, another option is just inputting the latitude longitude. You can only do that because they also use EPSG 4326, right? So they use the same coordinate reference system as the ones here. That's the only reason you can do it that way. Okay, so we've omitted this. And at this point, we're going to convert to spatial data. So here we're not um, changing anything. We're not changing a coordinate reference system or anything like that. We are actually respecting and acknowledging the coordinate reference system that that longitude and latitude are already in. So this ref this coordinate reference system, it's going to look like this, you know, 40 minus 80 for the Chicago area. Um, when it looks like this, um, and in this case, we also know it's EPSG 4326, right? Um, so when we're converting to a coordinate system, we do not add a new coordinate reference system. We have to use the coordinate reference system that that latitude and longitude are already in, right? That X, Y, there are thousands of different ways to represent X, Y. This is one way that is being used by 4326. So we pass in our um, CSV or our data frame object um, we pass in the coordinates, and then we pass in what CRS was used um, to generate those coordinates. Okay, um, here, note that a lot of times when people talk about latitude, longitude, they say it like that. What's your latitude, longitude? Well, it turns out that it's actually flipped around. XY actually corresponds to longitude, latitude. This error is so egregious that you'll actually find developers mislabel the latitude as longitude and vice versa. This has happened before. Um, so, so be careful, right? Your first step should be say it's longitude and then latitude, especially if you're using a geocoding surface because you can be certain that they did it correctly. Um, but in the future, if you're taking just another CSV that already has address level data and converting it, you may need to double check. And what do I mean by double checking? As soon as you finish this, you're going to want to 
um, map it out. So here I'm going to switch to this interactive version. And I'm going to map those dots right on top of Chicago. So now I know, without a doubt, these geocoded correctly. You have to do this after you convert. Otherwise, I promise you there will be much misery <laughs> to pay later because this it worked this time, but many times it won't work. And that's those are classic GIS errors, whether you're using R or, G, or ArcGIS or whatever. So you know, what could have gone wrong? Did you potentially flip the longitude latitude values? Maybe that was an error on your part. Maybe it was an error on whoever developed and shared the CSV that you're working with, okay? Another option is, did you input the correct CRS? In this case, we knew that the CRS was 4326. Many times you get data from the internet or from colleagues, and that is not shared with us. So we think it's 4326, but it could actually be something different. Um, that's a really tough error to resolve, but um, that is something that you'll have to do. And then for the first part, like for example, specifically in um, this this area um, in Chicago, if I flip it, um, the, the the coordinates will plot. I think on the west side of Africa. So that's how I know that. Okay, I that's like the inverse <laughs> the lat long here. So that's how I know. Um, but again, depending on where you are with your location, you might want to get familiar with, you know, where is the place in the world that's your inverse, <laughs> so that, um, you know, it, it'll be you, you, it'll become a familiar error to you. Okay, so at this point, let's overlay. We're going to bring back our um, our zip codes, and at this point, and at this point, I'm bringing um, a, a zip code that. I've written to as a GeoJSON in the previous um, one. And we're gonna switch back into plot mode and we're gonna start plotting. So we're gonna plot the same piece from last time, the COVID case rates, jinx, we have all that information, but now we're gonna overlay in our, our clinics. Um, when you're overlaying clinics, we um, when you're working with point data and there's more description about this in the workbook, when we're working with point data, we're either going to um, show them as dots, as individual points, or as bubbles. And so I'll talk about the bubbles in a second, but first let's talk about the dots. So dots are just points, right? We're going to have a pretty small size, 0.2. We're going to give them a, a dark gray color. I like to work with the gray range um, just to kind of adjust for, I don't know, that, that's just my style. We're going to also add, um, so we keep our cartographic styling. We'll put the legend outside and keep it to the right. Unfortunately, in SF right now, um, symbols don't get the same legend TLC that areas do. So we have to actually add, like hack a manual symbology to add the, le um, add the dots in the legend. So this is a trick that, you know, from the depths of some Stack Overflow exchange, um, TM add legend. Um, the symbol is going to be like that's the call for a dot basically um, and then we're going to color it the same exact color same size and label it method on um, MOUD so we're going to do that. All right, so here we go, um, so we see that and again. Um, we don't. We didn't map this right away because we want to go through the steps of ensuring that the points are plotting where they're supposed to be. We're already using the zip code quite a bit, or the zip code area data set, so we don't have to worry about. Um, like we know that that's being projected properly and that sort of thing as well. So these these two things are being overlaid on top of each other. For overlays, they don't technically have to be in the same CRS. They could be in different ones, but it's a little bit open to potential error. So just kind of keep that in mind. It will project it however it thinks it should be projected. So you could get some strange behavior happening. But um, in the next chapter, we'll we'll show you how to just to kind of you know project everything to the to one standard projection to start. But though you already have some hints from that from the first um, thing today. All right, so next step, um, let's bring in some more data, right? Um, so oftentimes, we um, this is another option. So we more often or not, we'll have data that we find that will have an address that we want to plot. So this might be with crime data, for example, right? You'll have crime data that has, it may have the latitude, longitude, 
already. Um, so you don't have to geocode it. So for that kind of thing, um, here we're looking at affordable rental housing developments. Um, we're bringing this in just as another way to kind of think about this could be useful for our analysis. Um, maybe better outcomes are associated with better access to affordable housing options and mass. Or because it's COVID, we could also hypothesize that um, these more population dense places could be more vulnerable to airborne disease. So you could do the same thing for nursing homes, for example, right? But in this case, we're going to hypothesize that access to secure and affordable housing is a plus, um, or at least for our MOUD population of interest. So here, again, this is straight from this, the city data portal. We have the address, and I can just tell you now, looking at the address, this would be difficult to geocode because you can see some really strange ways that it's being recorded. Um, management company units. So this is corresponding to total number of units per housing development. So there is an additional attribute to our point level data set. And then here we also see a lot of information. We see X and Y coordinate in this you know, um, so this is one coordinate reference system, essentially. And then we also see latitude and longitude, which is a, in a totally different coordinate reference system. So, um, and unfortunately, the metadata for this file is not very, you know, as is very common for data portals, we don't, we don't know what the coordinate reference systems are. So here, we essentially have to guess. And we have to take a chance, pick a coordinate reference, or pick a coordinate x y um, pair, and then um, and then go from there. Okay, so um, so let's do that. So here I already told you if it looks more like 40s and minus 80s, it's very likely to be um, the uh, EPSG 4326, which is most common. Um, here it's also labeled latitude longitude, which is another good sign. Notice that whatever coder coded this as the, the location flipped it around. So they said that the latitude is the X parameter and the longitude is the Y parameter, which is incorrect. Okay, just wanted to put that out there. Um, and then here, the X, Y coordinates, to me, this looks like a UTM coordinate reference system. But there's a lot of different reference systems. So I'm a little bit more nervous about that one. So I'm going to take this latitude longitude and just try that one. So first, we're going to remove um, nulls because, again, it turns out there are some here, and we're just trying to be efficient with our time. Um, we want to look at the structure of what we have just to make sure that the latitude longitude is a numeric value. If it's not numeric, we would have to switch it into a numeric value. Um, and from that point on, we don't have to do any of the geocoding stuff. We can jump straight to that STSSF function. So here again, longitude, latitude. We're hoping, fingers crossed, that it's 4326. And let's see how that is going to work. Um, we're going to map that out. And you know, does this kind of look like Chicago? To me, it does, but I'm from here. And so, you know, but you could also switch this into um, a interactive map as we did it in a previous step, just to just to be certain. Okay. Um, all right, and so at that point, I mentioned as well, or when we were looking at the data, we also have this parameter, uh, or not this parameter, this attribute of units, which will give us total number of units by development. So this is also kind of giving us a weight to the developments, right? All developments have different capacities, so they're not equal, right? Um, if there are more developments with more units available in an area, that'll be very different than you know, one, one development with a few units um, and vice versa. So um, here we're going to use what's called a graduated symbology. Um, essentially, and here I'm going to bring this over here on this side, um, just so that we have a little bit more room. So we're going to take our zips and, you know, map them just with a very simple gray background. But now we're going to layer over that the individual um, housing uh, locations, but we're going to use a graduated symbology. Uh, in TMAP, they call this TM bubbles. So essentially, larger units will have bigger bubbles, and then smaller units will have smaller bubbles. And just to make a nice contrast with the gray, we're going to color that purple. So we can run that.
Okay. And here we can see that pretty nicely. So um, here, the units, it's getting um, shifted into different categories. So up to 100, 200, 400, 600. Um, and we can see all the different options available. So we can see there's a lot in this section right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor moving around, but kind of south of this central area, there's quite a lot on the north side and there's a scattering through other parts of the city. Okay, um, so this can be useful. And then in the last step, um, I'll maybe not uh, render that part, but in the last step, we essentially bring all of that together, um, add some labels, um, well, here, let's see. I guess uh, maybe just doing this one part won't hurt. Um, but essentially, when we bring all of this together, we can start to see some really interesting trends. So um, by adding labels of the zip codes onto the COVID map, we can now really quickly identify which zip codes um, were of concern, right? Those areas that were persistently high, no matter which classification strategy we took. But then we can also see where are places with um, you know, access to methadone maintenance. And this is a medication that's required um, daily to weekly um, for, for many individuals. So um, you need to access it regularly if it's very, very far, especially during the pandemic, the chances of you um, choosing to not take it anymore are very high. So, um, so for example, 60623, seems to have three or four facilities, which is great. And there's also a lot of um, affordable rental housing units there, um, which could be considered that there might be more services in general um, for people. So that this is 60623 is doing pretty well. In contrast, look at 60639, 32, and 29. These three zip codes have no um, uh, maintenance MOUDs. Um, either in the zip code or for the most part nearby. There's, you know, maybe a few that are kind of nearby. Um, but there's also very, very few units uh, or affordable housing units to begin with, right? So from our perspective, this may be a flag of, um, you know, potential vulnerability for these groups. Okay, I'm going to stop here and we'll go back to the, um, let's see, let's go back to our talk to kind of bring this whole thing home. All right, go for it, Susan. Wonderful, thank you, Marinia. So um, uh, I know we're running a little bit short on time, but I think we'll be fine. Um, but I'm gonna move somewhat uh, more quickly through this section just so we have you know time for Q&A at the end. Um, but this is, um, in, in this last part of today's workshop, um, we wanted to highlight how you might be thinking about generating some of your own spatial metrics um, based on your data and, and some of the uh, questions and services you might be working with. Um, and uh, in the world of in the world of, of our spatial that we work in, we, we think a lot about spatial access, um, obviously. Um, but um, so we're going to be looking at calculating some spatial access metrics today, um, but we also wanted to provide some context that there are a lot of other ways to think about access. And before talking about spatial access as one dimension specifically, we need to sort of think a little more broadly and consider what is accessibility. Um, and this is, of course, really important in the um, healthcare and medical field, um, because as we discuss how accessible a healthcare resource or services, this has a direct impact on um, patients' interactions with it. Um, so uh, accessibility is a very multidimensional concept and spatial, uh, spatial distance, of course, is only one component of accessibility. Um, in sort of the classical uh, research model presented by uh, Pachansky and Thomas in 1981, uh, they define access as a general concept that summarizes a set of more specific dimensions describing the fit between the patient and the healthcare system. So this is the degree of fit or match between the two sides of the providers and the clients or supply and demand. So they outline five dimensions of accessibility. This includes availability, accessibility, 
affordability, acceptability, and accommodation. So we'll be talking about the spatial accessibility factor today. Next slide, please. I'm actually just going to actually let's go to the next slide. I'm going to skip over this um, just in the interest of time, but I think that that, you know, th this next piece sort of gets at gets at what what that last slide had, but there's sort of two key questions that I, um, I think are really essential when we think about how do we choose the right measure of access. So the first question is how should distance between the user and the facility be characterized. So for example, should we use the travel time um, from a residential location to a facility? Um, would the driving distance be more in, uh, relevant than travel time? Or is there sort of another unit of measurement in there that we might think about? And related to that, the second question that we need to consider is what assumptions about folks' travel behaviors um, across space, um, across place, are most important, or 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 what what assumptions are are most appropriate uh, here? So, for example, if we're using travel time, um, you know, if we're talking about an urban center such as the city of Chicago or any other large city with public transportation. Um, or even not a large city with public transportation, are our users or our patients or individuals, members of the community going to be using public transit? So should our, our travel um, estimates uh, feature public transit times or are they gonna be driving or will they be walking? Um, those are all very different travel modes and travel times, of course. So um, another way to think about it is that if we consider accessing different resources, so accessing a trauma center versus an ambulance um, or accessing a playground for kids uh, versus accessing a grocery store, all of these things are going to have different travel behaviors. Um, and uh, those, those are all questions, of course, that are, are related to, to public health, but that folks use very different travel modes um, to access a grocery store versus a public park, for example. So with this question in mind, um, now we can think about different measurements of access. Um, we're gonna, do, I'm gonna present a very high level overview of some density access measurements as well as proximity, and then we'll actually um, calculate those as well. So, um, uh, I'm going to actually this map just highlights uh, a couple of different options, but this mostly highlights uh, proximity access measures for this is the state of Illinois, um, in which Chicago is located in the top right, but these are all sort of again different ways of presenting access measures um, of uh, individual communities access to different medications for opioid use disorder for some other research um, that is forthcoming from our lab. The next slide, please. So with the container method, um, this technique focuses on usually the count of facilities or a measure of services provided by any geographic unit. So in the context of uh, MOUDs, for example, we might ask questions like how many methadone providers are there in each zip code or within a one mile buffer of each zip code? or within a one mile buffer of the provider of the clinics. Um, or we might ask what percentage of each zip code is uh, within a reasonable threshold of a methadone provider's service area. So these are sort of just examples of the type of questions that we can try to start to answer with the container method. And in the next slide, um, proximity methods are another approach to measuring access. We're going to be focusing on calculating the minimum distance um, uh, as a as an access measure proxy. Minimum distance is generally uh, not including travel time, so it's not the distance that that's not necessarily the road travel distance, but rather it's the minimum straight line distance. Um, but this is actually uh, quite commonly used in traditional public health research as a proxy for access, although in, um, uh, you know, al although with the incredible resources in, in GIS and spatial analysis, we're increasingly be able to measure more travel time and count of resources within a set travel time and just really drilling down and making, being able to calculate more precise um, access measures. 
So other prox uh, proximity methods focus on how close a healthcare resource or service might be. So again, this might be minimum distance. Um, this could be the travel cost or a measure of the total or average distance of travel times between origins and destinations. And then as we get to more advanced me metrics, we might use some gravity potential measures where resources are weighted by size and adjusted for like friction of distance. Um, so we actually have a lot more resources on these things. We're not going to present them here today, but wanted to highlight that um, this is all uh, available in, in our, actually in our spatial ecosystem as well. So next slide. And I think we're, we're back to the R coding, Marinia. All right, so let's bring this home. And I do, I really like live coding as much as possible. But I think that, again, we just had so much and some great questions. I wanted to make sure that we weren't <laughs> losing. So um, I'll, I'll, I may do more of the just rendering our markdown than I would normally do in a session like this. Um, okay, but so for here, um, again, from the past few like work tutorials, um, we've mainly been doing visualizations. And that's usually what a lot of people think of when they think of mapping and spatial analysis. Um, but this is, again, from our perspective, just the start. We really want to start to then um, actually quantify some of those insights at the neighborhood level. So, um, for example, we just looked at a bunch of resources and we made some nice maps, but like, let's, how can we integrate that into an actual metric um, at the zip code level, right? So for our purposes, we're going to develop two me uh, metrics uh, using a container method approach, which is, you know, it's like the intro level, but for a lot of research, that is, that's perfectly fine. Um, and as long as you're, you know, contextualizing it in, you know, what environment does that, that make sense? So first, we're going to look at what are the total number of providers by zip code. And then number two, we're going to look at um, and it will will first generate walkable MOUD service areas, and then we'll actually get a total number of those services by by the zip code. Um, I should preface this is usually when you're doing this on your own. This is usually where bugs will go wild. So, um, getting really familiar with the first three is really strongly recommended so that you have the stomach <laughs> to handle any um, potential bugs that come up here. Um, sometimes there'll be strange bugs that are not you think it's a sf issue where really it's a data issue or it's an merge issue that went wrong and that sort of thing so here just to be super um you know consistent i'm going to load the points um from that that i saved at the end of the last tutorial or you didn't see me save it but if you scroll down to the workbook that was the last stage but i'm also actually i'm actually going to bring in the initial zip code um shape file because for whatever reason um that um i that is working out pretty well so this is um here i'm actually going to and this is a good habit to get into um let's look at the dimensions of the points so for troubleshooting that will be very helpful so we have 25 points total and then what are the dimension of the areas 61 areas um here i mention that because for example in one of the earlier some other GeoJSON um, that I was working with, there was a dimension of like hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of zip codes, which didn't make sense. It still plotted correctly and acted correctly, um, but the, the dimensions were wrong or some, something was corrupted in the file. So in this case, we're working with two data sets we feel really good about. We check the dimensions, we're gonna keep on going. So we look at the point data, and that's what we've already um, looked at all, you know, in the previous section. Um, if we look at the areas, um, again, for, for this workbook, I recommend just reloading that initial shape file, um, just again, to make sure that there's no issues at all. So this is, again, a very basic shape file. Um, if we want, again, we can just reattach all the other CSV information that we pulled in from a previous tutorial. Next step, we have to switch everything into a projection that is going to preserve feet or, or, or that will preserve distance as something that we understand and we recognize. Um, technically, that's, uh, you know, I mean, I can be more technical, but I, I find that that language can get confusing and it's easy to misunderstand the concept. So let's just say that our goal is to get into a projection that uses feet or meters. 
Um, if you're outside of the US, you'll probably look for one that uses meters. So um, I literally just searched again, EPSG, Illinois feet, and then EPSG 3435 came up and that is the one that we're going to use. We're going to run this to transform um, both our areas and points. To a question earlier, there are different ways. You can either input the actual number or you can input projection equals um, whatever. Like there is another version in, in chapter one. And anyone that tells you that there's a best practice, that's the best practice for them. You have to figure out what is the best practice for you. Um, so I feel very strongly about that sort of thing. <laughs> so this is mean, maybe not even be my best practice, but again, I'm trying to make it um, just really simple so that you guys can adapt it into your own um, work atmospheres. When you're preparing to do spatial variable calculation, as soon as you inspect the data and make sure that everything's in the same projection, immediately, even if you're sure, even if you're 100% sure, you still want to overlay the points on the areas just to make sure that everything is working correctly. If they're not loading in the same place, you immediately know that something went wrong. It could be a projection issue. It could be a bunch of different things, but immediately do that. So this is just a, a check to make sure that we're, we have what we think we have. So next up, we're going to do a simple uh, spatial join. And so here we're doing it with resource data. However, many of you may want to do this with patient data. So once you have an, you know, a specific location, a uh, Latin long that you've converted into points, maybe you want to know how many patients live in each zip code or census tract to develop a clinical prevalence estimate by that area, right? Maybe you want to develop, uh, maybe you've been working with crime data and you want to have total number of crimes by census tract to then develop a crime rate estimate, right? You, you can bring in population, calculate your own rate. So here, we're going to do this with a really awesome function, stjoin. So we're going to use stjoin, and this is just in the simplest way possible. Um, we're going to take our point data and essentially attach or stick all the information of whatever uh, zip code it is on top of, OK? Um, the geocomputation text, I think that's been linked a couple times already, has a whole section. Go to that geocomputation text, um, the vector operation section, or just search, you know, spatial join. Search spatial join anywhere. And, you know, spatial join R, you're going to get a lot of different feedback. Um, and we don't have time to go into all the different topological intersection modes. Um, but this is just the simplest approach for, um, for here. So we do that. And we have the same point information, but now we also have what um, the zip code information. So now that is all there. You might be thinking, why would I do that if zip code is already in my address? This is a demo, right? So imagine the address isn't there, or <laughs> imagine you have um, track level data that you wanted to integrate and that sort of thing. Okay, so it's the same concept regardless of what areas uh, you're working with. Um, at this stage, before we continue, let's look at the dimension of um, this point and polygon data frame. Okay, 25. This has to match the total number of points that we had. 25. Great. If those two are very different, you need to go back and figure out what went wrong. This is a really common point where things can go wrong. Um, for some reason, for example, I was working on a different iteration of this and the point in polygon just multiplied the number of rows by a factor of nine. Couldn't figure it out, um, you know, hours later after a couple of restarts and just like redoing everything, it was working correctly. Um, but again, so check your dimensions and then just to be sure, you know, check your dimensions for your areas again. So we're good. Um, at this point, we are just going to take, um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. So again, SF is uh, tidy compatible. Um, here, we're going to use a really simple, lame way <laughs> to count a frequency of how many times, um, you know, what, how many times or how many rows um, uh, show up for each zip code, right? So this method, we're going to only get um, zip codes that have frequencies. We're not going to have zero frequencies because it's only looking for um, rows that showed up essentially, um, if that makes sense. If that doesn't make sense, I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, so we have that and this is called var1 frequency. So we're gonna rename it just to make 
a join really, really simple easier and in easy later on, we're going to rename our var as lowercase zip because that's going to match my master file. And then I rename my new spatial variable. So we look at that, we merge it. Here, having this all equals true is going to be really important. So you can just bookmark that for yourself if you want to check that out later. This way, we're not losing zip codes that had zero frequency. And then we're going to map it to make sure that it did what we wanted. Um, and it does. <laughs> so this is success. And at this stage, too, you can decide, do you want to change the NAs to zeros? Because we know that they actually are zeros and not NAs. That's going to be up to you and your R skills. Um, but this is just, again, the, like one way of like once once you have that spatial join um, uh, file, you can you can do a lot of different work um, to get it to, to what you want it to look like. All right, and then to bring this on home very quickly, um, let's create some buffers, right? So um, a point in Polygon is is helpful, but like especially for especially for providers, um, you know these two zip codes that are right next to this one provider have a it's it's a very you know stark you know the zero right there is actually very different than the ones by O'Hare by the airport on the left hand side because they're literally right across from a provider probably. These lines often follow um, street lines, but it's not, it's considered to not have a provider. So that's, that doesn't work out very well, right? So this is a very, very conservative, you know, way of, of looking at things. Another approach would be to create a buffer. So let's say we'll create a walkable buffer of one mile for each provider location. And then we're going to have a count of buffers by area to see if that gives us a little bit better idea. So on this map, we can see this one zip code on the west side has the most providers located within. We'll see how the, the map at the end looks. So for buffers, it's one line of code. For those of you who have done like, you know, ArcGIS or QGIS, this is shocking how easy this is. That's really the reason I, I switched over. So just ST buffer, passing the points, um, 5,280 feet, that's the unit of my CRS here, is equal to one mile. Um, if you want, there's also a units package, but you can, you know, Google one mile equals how many feet, and you've got it. Um, and that's it. We have, and this is creating an actual new spatial file. It's pol they're polygons, they're not points, right? So let's map this really quickly. And we can see that right here. So um, we can see that there's, um, some concentrations with many walkable MOUD sites and then other areas without without that. Um, so here is another technique to um, count the total buffers by area. Again, I challenge you to, to find a more optimal way. Um, and again, you can pipe all of these to have this all done in one setup. But I, I find that when you're learning, it helps just to have it section out step by step. And then we're going to stick the buffers back into the master file. And if I want, let's look at the area file. Um, now we have our zip code area file and we have these two new variables that have been added, right? And if I want, I can also merge the CSV of all the other stuff earlier that we did earlier as well. And if we map that, um, we should be able to see some pretty cool stuff. So here is something that shows out. And here I've also gotten a little bit more fancy where um, for the buffers, I made them, um, I filled them um with a uh, light gray and i've made them transparent so it kind of creates this cool um overlay effect where when they the two places overlay it gets a little bit thicker uh, or like a or maybe not thicker maybe brighter is, is the term that i'm looking for what's interesting here is that that place on the west side is no longer as noticeable you can see this place on the south side it only has two providers in that zip code, but multiple ones surrounding. So that's actually now considered a little bit more accessible from that perspective. However, note those three zip codes we were really concerned about um, up here to the left, up here, or, and then these two on the west side um, also are not even within walkable distance of MOUDs, okay? So that's kind of extending that hypothesis a little bit further. And from here on out, um, so we commonly develop metrics like this, and then we'll use these metrics and statistical models. So that's how you start to operationalize the trends that you see is by trying different stuff out, developing a metric that matches um, 
what you've learned and something that's backed by the evidence as well, hopefully, right? And then from there, we can use that in a statistical model um, or, you know, another type of model would be a point pattern analysis, but that's, that's another topic. So I include here some questions just to think about, um, but I think at this point, it's a good place to stop so that we have at least 15 minutes for Q&A or we may get booted out to, um, to give everyone some time to, to chat. <laughs> All right, so any questions, I guess, or resources that folks want to share or, um, or actually, should we go back to the, here, I'm going to sw actually switch to the, um, we had a really, or Susan had a really nice um, final wrap up piece. Okay. We wanted to share, um, I think we've talked, we've touched on all of these resources. Uh, at some point over the course of the last few hours, but um, share these links as additional places to to learn more. And of course, there's also been a ton more um, shared in the chat. So thank you for thank you everyone who's been asking questions and participating in the chat as well. I'm just going to drop this the links from this slide right and I'll here. I'll note too that so the opiate environment toolkit also has a tutorial for pulling data from the census and then having it ready for mapping immediately. So that's based off of Kyle Walker's often documentation, but um, so check that out. And then also there's a toolkit or a tutorial about how to create the minimum distance measure that Susan was talking about earlier. Um, and just before opening up to questions, we also wanted to highlight that um, there is a session today of the highlighting all the great posters that folks have submitted um, and in this in this cool uh, spatial chat platform. Um, so definitely check that out um, later today. I was trying to add the little like celebration icon, but it it, it misunderstood <laughs> what I wanted it to do. <laughs> yes, and then feel free to connect with us. I feel like Twitter is the new um stack overflow <laughs> in so many ways so if you have questions feel free to you know um i think our spatial like as the as a twitter handle or spatial chat i forgot um there's 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 just if you just start to follow i mean many of you are probably here because of that as well um but just resolving questions um a lot of the developers themselves are on twitter so that that's super helpful All right, questions though, concerns, what are things that are, um, like for example, with the Polias off, maybe would, would developing like a short one pager about offline geocoders be helpful for folks? Just, yeah, and just feel free to let us know what would be helpful going forward. Oh, and thank you guys, I'm going through the chat now. You guys are super kind. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and then a question about pan-US geospatial data. Yes, so OpenStreetMap. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Um, Pan-US, US wide zip code polygons. So actually, Abhi, for the US wide zip code polygons, check, that's that's already cleaned and ready to go in the OEPS database. And we literally created that partly because people kept on asking us for data. And it was getting really frustrating. So we were like, let's find an excuse from one of the grants just to put it all together. So um, that I think would be a great resource. All the, I think all the zip codes are available as a GeoJSON there. Um, so that's good. You can also get it through, um, I think if you Google Tiger uh, zip, I, I will note that the new data census site is not as intuitive or easy to use as the older one. So, so note that. But then also for um, folks outside of the US, um, OpenStreetMap is a really phenomenal resource for data outside of the US. Um, I think one of the TAs also is um, slightly famous for her developed um, package in, um, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that for a minute or about even like geospatial data access for places outside the US. Let's see. I think that was Shell. Um, I also just wanted to know, and so I someone else uh, put this in the chat already, but the Tigris R package mm -hmm. has the tiger line shape files like built in as an R package. So that's a great way to, to integrate um, 
accessing those shape files with R. Cool. Oh, Shell had to step away. Okay. Well, that was Shell. Um, or look her up on look 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 up her name because um, we shared that in the slides, and I'm sure we'll see her throughout the rest of the conference. Cool. And I think that creating more data packages is something that's of great interest. So also, if you're interested in that, to kind of shift to the development side, um, like we've been thinking about shifting the OEPS database, which is again, it's really it's it's about opioids for the for the grant, but it's really about just a, like a repo to data that <laughs> health researchers uh, or social science researchers need. We could also flip that into an R data package, right? Um, so if there is interest for folks to help with that, just reach out. That could be a fun project. Um, I know SP data and SP data large also have a lot of really great um, uh, data available for different things. Oh, and it's uh, Tigris, T-I-G-R-I-S. Let me see. Yeah, I think that with a, the hardest part with this field is just getting used to the jargon, because unless you know the jargon, it's hard to Google search your answers, um, but all good. All right, well, thank you all. A huge thank you to the TAs for, I mean, you guys have been not only like supporting the workshop and answering questions, but generating new ideas. So this is super, super interesting. Cool. Yes, and we are geospatial nerds. <laughs> so it sounds like a plan. Awesome. Thank you, thank all you so guys much. so much. We'll see you at the rest of the conference, okay? Cool. Bye, guys. Bye.